Welcome everyone. My name is Pedro Falci and I'm proud to serve as the Associate Director of the Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground at Boston University. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome back, albeit virtually, New York Times bestselling author, Larry Tai. Larry is the author of Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy, which we will discuss tonight. We had the privilege of last hosting Larry in 2016 to talk about his biography of Robert F. Kennedy, the former Attorney General, U.S. Senator, and Presidential Candidate. Bobby Kennedy, the making of a liberal icon, explores RFK's extraordinary transformation from a cold warrior to a fiery leftist. It's a fantastic read, one of my favorite books, and you'll see it behind Larry right now. Larry's other titles include The Father of Spin, a biography of public relations pioneer Edward L. Bernays. Homelands, about the Jewish renewal underway from Boston to Buenos Aires. Rising from the Rails, which explores how the black men who worked on railroad sleeping cars helped kickstart the civil rights movement. And Shock, a collaboration with former Massachusetts First Lady Kitty Dukakis, which is Larry's first person account of ECT, psychiatry's most controversial treatment and a portrait of how that therapy helped one woman overcome debilitating depression. Larry also penned Satchel to his right and Superman, the high flying history of America's most enduring hero. Larry, I read that one too and loved it. Before writing these excellent titles, Larry served as an acclaimed journalist who from 1986 to 2001 was an award-winning reporter at the Boston Globe where his primary beat was medicine. He also served as the Globe's environmental reporter, roving national writer, investigative reporter, and sports writer. He is a Brown University graduate who has taught journalism at Northeastern, Tufts, and our very own BU. Larry is currently writing for Houghton Mifflin a book entitled The Jazz Men, How Duke Ellington, Satchmo Armstrong, and Count Basie Transformed America. Larry, it's so great to have you with us to talk about Joe McCarthy. Welcome. So it's great to be back. And I love the idea that the Thurman Center, which is all about building common ground, has me on four years ago to talk about a book that was all about common ground because it was about Bobby Kennedy, who was an incredible unifying figure in America. And four years later, we're talking about one of the most uh, the divisive figures in American history, the demagogue, Joe McCarthy. And what I would like to do before we get into uh, the substance of what I wanna talk about with McCarthy, I wanna talk for a minute since lots of scholars here at BU and the, um, I wanna talk a bit about the process of writing this book. And one of the things that you ought to all ask when you're reading a biography about somebody who's been written about as much as Joe McCarthy has, is why does the world need the 101st book on Joe McCarthy? And I think you're much too polite to ask that, but I wanna to try to answer it anyway. The answer is that in part, um, I had access to three stashes of materials that nobody had seen before. One of them was a collection of 9,000 pages of transcripts of the closed door hearings that Joe McCarthy held. And this guy held some very famous public hearings, but two thirds of the time he called a Senate hearing, he kicked out the press, he kicked out the public, and he kicked out any sense of anybody ever knowing what he was doing. And these hearing transcripts had been made public before I started writing my book, but nobody had really taken a deep dive into them. And the guy who made them public, the official historian of the US Senate, was a pal of mine who said these transcripts were extraordinary. And it turned out they were. They showed us Joe McCarthy unhinged. Joe McCarthy, when he thought nobody was looking, and when he could even a pretense of pretending to care about the rights of the accused went out the window when the reporters went out the door. It also showed us that Joe McCarthy in these hearings in the morning was sober in his consideration of the issues. But in the afternoon, after he had his trademark lunch, uh, 
of a hamburger, a raw onion, and plenty of whiskey, any sense of sobriety, any sense of control went out the window, and you didn't want to appear before Joe McCarthy in the afternoon when his fuse was short and he was likely to make your life even more miserable. So one set of materials I had were all of these extraordinary transcripts of his closed door hearings. A second set of documents, um, you know at BU, uh, you have the Gottlieb Center and lots of other great library resources there where people who are very famous people like Martin Luther King leave their personal and professional papers. Well, Joe McCarthy did the same thing at his alma mater, which is a school called Marquette in Milwaukee. And for 60 years, biographers have been knocking on the family's door saying, we'd love to see those papers. And for 60 years, ever since McCarthy's widow left the papers there, his family has been saying no. And from day one of signing my book contract, I started knocking on the door. And I knocked and I knocked and I knocked and nobody seemed to be answering. And one day, shockingly, I got an email from the chief archivist at Marquette who said, you're gonna be almost as, as surprised as I was to hear that the family has decided that you ought to be able to take a look at these. And it's decided them in a strange way, which is you can come in and look and the day you stop looking, they go back under lock and key. And those papers included everything from his love letters to his ultimate wife, to his records when he was in the Marines in World War II, his real-time handwritten diaries, to one paper after another that had a stamp on them that said top secret. And these were papers that were leaked to him from the FBI and from the CIA and from all across the government. So finally, we had a look at what his, all of his most cherished documents were really all about. So stash number one is his closed door hearing transcript. Stash number two is the dreamed about and long sought personal and professional papers. Stash number three, I got in an even more unlikely way. One morning, uh, from our home on Cape Cod, my wife and I were out with the dog for an incredibly early morning walk. And she pointed to the head of the driveway and said, what's that big box doing there? And I said, I have no idea. I don't know what it is, but it will be there when we get back. And she said, no, we're not going anywhere. We've got to look and see what it is now. And it turned out those were the records that I've been asking for for two years all of Joe McCarthy's medical records from Bethesda Naval Hospital, the kinds of records that showed in this case, the addictions that Joe McCarthy had, showed what he really died of, which was not what the coroner told us he had died of, and gave us a behind the scenes peek at what his life was really all about in the most cherished records that any of us have, which is our most personal medical files. So the bottom line is, given those access to those three stashes of papers, uh, I'm too close to say whether I wrote a good book, but if I couldn't write a good book with all of that stuff, shame on me. And I now want to take you for a minute, if you will indulge me, I wanna take you to three moments in Joe McCarthy's life that I think offer a lens into who this guy was. And the first moment was the night that his crusade against communism was born. And for those of you who are BU students who are too young to remember the era of Joe McCarthy, I wanna tell you that the red scare of the 1950s um, was embodied in this man and in the movement that ended up becoming named after him called McCarthyism. And the moment where that movement was born was on February 9, 1950 in a very unlikely place in a city called Wheeling, West by God, Virginia. And the West by God is the way Joe McCarthy and his staff referred to where he was going that night. In the middle of what seemed like nowhere, and I apologize if anybody here is from West Virginia, uh, it was a night, this February 9, 1950, when Republicans all across America get together to raise money and to raise their spirits. It is the birthday 
of Abraham Lincoln, the patron saint of the Republican Party. And if you're a prominent Republican politician, you get invited to places like Washington in New York, Chicago in Boston. When you were Joe McCarthy, who looked like he was destined to be a one-term, quickly forgotten US Senator, you get invited to some burg like Wheeling, West Virginia. He showed up there that night, and I wanna give you a sense of what America was like at the beginning of 1950. We were a country that I think was most defined by a single word, and that word was fear. We were afraid because we had watched recently nationalist China be transformed to red China. We had watched the FBI arrest and the government try and convict the atomic spies, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. We were about to teach our children, and this is something that nobody who didn't live through it will believe. We were about to teach our children what was called duck and cover. And what that meant was, if there was an atomic explosion in America, all school children had to do was put their hands over their head and duck under their desks and they would be okay. But the idea that we were teaching our children what to do in the event of an atomic explosion suggested just how, fear, how fearful Americans were of this menacing presence, the Soviet Union, our arch enemy. And it was in that kind of an environment that Joe Kennedy went to Wheeling, West Virginia. He brought with him an enormous briefcase. And in that briefcase, he had two speeches. One of them, the first speech on the top of the briefcase, was a snoozer of a speech on national housing policy. And if Joe McCarthy had delivered that speech that night, 70 years later, we wouldn't be here talking about Joe McCarthy. But instead, he reached deeper into his briefcase. He produced a set of papers. He held them up in his right hand. And he said, I have in my hand here tonight the list of 205 spies in our very own State Department. These are people who pose a mortal danger to America. These are people who President Truman should have known about. And he should have rooted them out of our government. And instead, they're still there, and I'm going to do the work of rooting them out of our government. Now, what he, in fact, was holding in his hand that night could have been his grocery list. It could have been a recycled set of documents that had come before his committee. It could have been anything but what McCarthy said it was, because there weren't 205 spies at the State Department. And if there were, Joe McCarthy sure as heck didn't know about them but it didn't matter. It was so dramatic that without even requiring his showing them to the journalists who were present, he made page one of the local newspaper the next day and of every newspaper in America by the day after that. Joe McCarthy was calling the president somebody who was compromising America's safety and his crusade was off and running. There was a red scare before Joe McCarthy, but nobody had ever quite understood the way that Joe McCarthy did, that you didn't just have to say there were traitors in the State Department, you had to count them, and he counted 205, and you had to name them, and he promised to do that, even though he never did that. And he was, as I said, on page one that week, and he was on page one just about every day after that for the next four long years. He got better press than the two presidents he served under, and he was certainly the best known senator in all of America. So our moment number one, our milestone moment number one for Joe McCarthy is in 1950 in Wheeling, where his crusade and where the movement became known as McCarthyism were born. Moment number two that I want to take you to is almost exactly four years later. And the setting at this point is that Joe McCarthy has accused the State Department of harboring communist moles. He's accused the White House. He's accused the government printing office. He's accused the Voice of America. The list of agencies is a long one. But a couple months before our moment at the beginning of 1954, he took on the biggest target of all, the mighty US military.
And he said that a particular base, an army base called Fort Monmouth in New Jersey, was a place where lots of communist spies were. He said that these were spies planted by Julius Rosenberg. And he said again that these people in this very critical military installation, which housed the Army Signal Corps, which was the command and control center for all the US armed services, he said this vital base was rife with spies and traitors who were compromising the integrity of the Army and the security of the United States of America. At the same time he was accusing the Army, he was pressuring the army to give special treatment to a young aide of his who had just been drafted. And all of this was going on at a fairly low level, but as he didn't make another accusation against the army, the army finally started accusing back and the US Senate, Joe McCarthy's colleagues said, we're not sure what's going on. We've got to call a very special set of hearings that became known as the Army McCarthy hearings, the most well-publicized, the most heavily watched hearings in the history of our Republic. And on one side was McCarthy pointing the finger at the Army. On the other side was the Army pointing the finger back at him. When those hearings started at the beginning of 1954, Joe McCarthy's favorability rating in the Gallup poll was 50% which was extraordinary for a US Senator. He was the second most popular public figure in America, trailing only our war hero president, Dwight Eisenhower. But in the middle of those hearings, if anybody has ever studied in one of your history classes or anywhere else, the Army McCarthy hearings, there is one moment in the middle of those hearings that everybody thinks of, and it may have been the most famous moment ever for an attorney in America. The most famous words ever uttered by an attorney in those hearings were the attorney for the US Army. And it was a Boston-based guy named Joe Welch, who McCarthy had gone after. McCarthy said that Joe Welch's young partner at his Boston law firm was a communist, that he was a member of a group that was a leftist group, and he was somebody not to be trusted. And McCarthy was trying to tarnish the reputation, not just of that young associate named Fisher, but of Joe Welch, his chief prosecutor during those hearings. And Welch had been dreaming of this kind of a moment. And Welch said these words, which are the famous words that I mentioned. He said, Senator, have you no sense of decency? At long last, have you no sense of decency? And all of America seemed to gasp at once when millions of people were watching him that day say those things to Joe McCarthy. And what was interesting is we now know when we go back and look after the fact that Joe Welch had had those words in his back pocket throughout the hearings, waiting for a magical moment when he knew McCarthy would go one step too far. He delivered them, not just like a lawyer, but, a, but like a trained actor. And those words, I think, had their impact, not because Joe Welch uttered them, but because all of America by that moment, midway through the hearings, was wondering the same thing. The guy who they went into the hearings thinking was their Superman, was their great hero in the Senate, crusading on their behalf by midway through the hearings, look more like the town bully that he was. And by the end of the hearings that August, Joe McCarthy's popularity had gone from that 50% that we talked about, they had plummeted to 34%. And once his popularity sunk to that level, suddenly his fellow senators started developing a backbone. And by that December, they censured him an incredibly rare thing that had only happened six times in our country's long history. And at that moment in December of 1954, Joe McCarthy was politically dead. He ended up living for another two and a half years until early 1957. And he ultimately died. We were told by the coroner and by the press that he died of acute hepatitis. What we can see now from his medical records is he died of alcoholism. 
he essentially drank himself to death. In the last couple of years of his life, he was drinking the equivalent of a fifth of whiskey a day. And that would be enough to kill anybody and it did kill John McCarthy. So moment number one is the beginning of his crusade in 1950. Moment number two is 1954 when he is politically dead and 1957 when he actually dies and is buried in Appleton, Wisconsin. The third moment I wanna take you to is when Joe McCarthy was dead, but McCarthyism was alive and well. And that is the moment of today. And I wanna tell you what I mean about McCarthyism being alive and well. The term McCarthyism is thrown around a lot and every politician who doesn't like another politician accuses them of being the worst slur word you can accuse somebody of, which is you're a McCarthyite. And that is nice. And I want to say that I want to be bipartisan about this. But the truth is there is one person in America who learned the lessons of Joe McCarthy better than anybody else. And that is our 45th president. And it wasn't an accident. The flesh and blood through line from Joe McCarthy to Donald Trump was a brilliant and arrogant lawyer from New York named Roy Marcus Cohn. When Joe McCarthy took over his subcommittee, the subcommittee that he made famous called the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, he needed a smart young lawyer to help him out with that. And he initially considered hiring Bobby Kennedy. And he did hire Bobby Kennedy, but in the number two slot. The number one slot went to this brilliant New York lawyer named Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn, during the time he served with Joe McCarthy over the next couple of years, reinforced every bad instinct in Joe McCarthy. Roy Cohn is the one who, as much as Joe McCarthy wanted to go after the army, Roy Cohn is the one who brought in a young aide who's the guy who ended up being drafted and Roy Cohn wanted Joe McCarthy to get this young guy special treatment, which is part of what set off the chain of events that did in Joe McCarthy. But more importantly, the discussion we're having now, 30 years later, 30 years after Joe McCarthy died, Roy Cohn was hired by two very prominent New York real estate executives, a guy named Fred Trump and his son, Donald Trump, to train Donald Trump for dealing with this new cutthroat world of the New York real estate market that Donald was entering. Roy Cohn was Donald Trump's primary tutor in the realities of hardball politics. Roy Cohn passed on to Donald Trump every lesson that he had learned at the knee of Joe McCarthy. And I wanna just give you some of my evidence and you can decide for yourself if the link is legitimate. I would suggest that demagogues like Joe McCarthy and Donald Trump in lieu of solutions give us scapegoats. And in McCarthy's case, the scapegoat was the communists hiding in places like the State Department that he blamed for everything that was wrong in America. In Donald Trump's case, the obvious scapegoats are the refugees who are streaming across the border and responsible for every sin that we see in our world. And both of them were quite brilliant in terms of how they did that. They played on very real fears. The fear of the Soviet enemy was real in the 1950s. The fact that it wasn't the spies at the State Department, the supposed spies at the State Department that were responsible for the Soviet threat didn't matter. The fear of economic dislocation for a big part of our population that's gotten left behind in various recoveries is real. The fact that it's not refugees who are responsible for that doesn't matter. They're a convenient scapegoat. What a demagogue does also is when one false charge that they've lobbed at you is proven to be hollow, the next day or that same day, they lob a fresh bombshell. When you see an assailant out there, your political enemy, you hit them twice as hard and twice as low. And when the news is bad, the same newsmen and newswomen who helped make you into the national figure that both Donald Trump and Joe McCarthy were made into with the enablement of the press, 
When the news is bad, you point the finger and blame the newsman. It is, I think, in one case after another, a situation where Joe McCarthy proved what a great student he was of his disciple, Roy Cohn, and his disciple's disciple, Donald Trump, uh, Joe McCarthy. But I want to suggest to you that my book, while it might be about the most malevolent figure in American history, Joe McCarthy, that it is in fact, and this is the note that I want to leave on before we turn to questions, it is in fact a good news story. And the good news is that throughout our long history of demagogues in America, from Huey Long and the anti-Semitic radio preacher from Michigan named Father Charles Coughlin, to uh, George Wallace and David Duke, you name the demagogue, every one of them, given enough rope, hung themselves. And every time, given enough time, Americans who bought into these bullies for too long eventually rediscovered, we have rediscovered our better nature and seen through them and said no to them. So I think while demagoguery is a part of our history, so is surmounting that incredible obstacle of having demagogues in our presence. And what I would like to do now is actually stop talking and see if we can turn this into a conversation. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for highlighting those three seminal moments in Joe McCarthy's life. And audience members, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A function. I'll be happy to read them to Larry. But let me start. Great. Larry, there are two figures in American politics in the 50s that had, a, had to face McCarthy and had to deal with him. You mentioned one, President Eisenhower. I'm wondering if you could talk about Eisenhower's handling of McCarthy, but also Vice President Richard Nixon, and if there was a simpatico or affinity between Nixon and McCarthy that would play itself out during Nixon's tenure as our president. Uh, so good question, and let's start with Eisenhower. And McCarthy had to get to power and to hold power for four years, you need lots of what I call enablers. You need people who make it easy for you to hold on to this kind of power and who reinforce your message. And Joe McCarthy had a number of enablers. He had the Texas oil men who gave him big checks and he was never at a loss for money. He had the US Senate, which once he showed that he could help unelect senators like he did with the first guy who attacked him from his Senate, a guy named Millard Tidings, a powerful senator from Maryland. McCarthy went in the next election, um, recruited a candidate to run against Tidings, recruited money that Tidings' um, opponent needed, lent this opponent uh, Joe McCarthy's bag of dirty tricks, and beat Millard Tidings. And that sent a very powerful message to other senators, which is you take on Joe McCarthy at your own risk. So the Senate became his second big enabler. But what I call his enabler in chief was Dwight Eisenhower. He was a president who realized early on when he was running for office just how dangerous McCarthy was because McCarthy went after one of his best friends, a war hero president who helped ensure the Allied victory in World War II, General George C. Marshall, who went on in peacetime to serve as our Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense. McCarthy put him at the center of an alleged conspiracy of communists, a totally outrageous charge. Eisenhower, during his campaign for president, was about to condemn McCarthy and basically call him out for the liar that he was. And Eisenhower's aides said, don't do that. McCarthy could screw up your nomination. He could confound your being elected. Don't do it. And Eisenhower, at the last minute, threw away his speech, never condemned McCarthy. From the day Eisenhower took office in January 1953, Eisenhower's brother, Milton, whispered in Dwight's ear, saying, take on the bully. Ike agreed that McCarthy was a bully, but he said, we're going to let him bring himself down. And that proved true that McCarthy did do himself in by taking on an enemy like the army that was too big to bully. 
But in the meantime, lives were ruined, careers were destroyed, and America was made a weaker place. And Eisenhower, I think, one of the only regrets he had in his life was not coming out earlier and stronger against Joe McCarthy. Richard Nixon was an entirely different case. And Richard Nixon was a red-baiting senator himself, a congressman who realized the anti-communist issue was one that could catapult him to power. Uh, when he became a senator, he was also, um, anti-communism was the centerpiece of his Senate platform. And in the White House, he became the toughest spokesperson on issues of communism. Richard Nixon, who was never beyond embellishing or even lying, Richard Nixon recognized how dangerous and how much worse of a liar Joe McCarthy was. Richard Nixon warned Eisenhower of that early on. And one of the only people in that era in America who could have made Richard Nixon look really good, like a good guy, was Joe McCarthy, and he did. And the two of them, McCarthy understood that Nixon was out for himself and was trying quietly to undermine him. And that's precisely what Nixon was doing. It's interesting, Larry. I know that uh, Dwight Eisenhower's granddaughter, Susan, just published a book called How Ike Led. And she was on WBUR last week. And this came up. She had to defend her grandfather's response to Joe McCarthy. It's definitely, uh, some would say, a blemish on Ike's record. It is, and it's one that historians have, I think, bent over backwards to defend Eisenhower. They say that he was exercising what they call the hidden hand behind the scenes and really helping do in Joe McCarthy. I think Ike had a hidden hand in a lot of cases, but in Joe McCarthy's case, it was an empty glove. Thank you. Let's turn to a question from Case, who is a current B student who I know very well. Case asks you, what do you think about demagoguery makes it self-sabotaging? So great question. I think what makes it self-sabotaging is um, the embellishment and lying that goes on behind the scenes. That by definition, um, so I use the word as the title of my book, demagogue, but a much simpler word is bully. And I think that the idea by definition, demagogues are offering us not real solutions, but scapegoats. They're offering us sort of phony, trumped up solutions that look like they're addressing problems. And over time, the emptiness of those solutions, I think, becomes apparent to the public. It, it should become apparent earlier, and one would hope that the press and others would point it out. Over time, demagogues are a tempting target for the press, and they start pointing out the embellishments. Over time, fellow politicians realize the vulnerability and the meanness of these demagogues. And over time, they all, as I say, do themselves in. But I wish over time were a shorter time because while I think it's all sort of, um, they're setting their own trap for themselves, those traps can take a long time and a lot of people can be caught in them in the interim. Larry, here's another question I have for you. Uh, naturally, in the Bobby Kennedy book, you looked at his greatest strengths, also his flaws, his shortcomings, his contradictions. In writing this book about Joe McCarthy, who is considered an American villain, what moments about his life or his personality actually made you take pause and appreciate things he may have done in his life? So that's a great question. And before I answer that, I want to answer another quick uh, question that you didn't ask. But the one of the things you and I were talking before we went live tonight um, about the fact that this Joe McCarthy book was inspired in part by what I, the research I did on Joe McCarthy as part of the Bobby Kennedy book. And the person who helped inspire this book was a woman named Ethel Kennedy. Bobby's widow, and at the time of Bobby's death in 1968, she was voted the most popular woman in America. And she said something to me about Joe McCarthy that leads into the question you just asked. She said, Joe McCarthy might have been a monster to much of America, but to Bobby and me, he was just plain good fun. Mm -hmm. Now I thought any adjectives in the world, monster I was not um, surprised to hear, but the adjectives of good fun, 
be applied to Joe McCarthy. I thought there's got to be another side to this guy, and I want to understand that side. And to me, anybody that you're writing about, if they're all good, if you make them out like Bobby Kennedy to be a saint, then it's not credible. Bobby Kennedy absolutely had lots of flaws and warts. And the idea that at the end of my book, I still found him a heroic figure was because he was flesh and blood by that time. He was somebody with faults who had managed to overcome those faults. Joe McCarthy didn't get to be a twice elected senator from uh, the state of Wisconsin by substantial margins by being only this mean, malevolent character. He was a charming guy. He was a charismatic guy. He's the kind of guy that I wish I could have gone out for a beer with. And I want to just give you an example of the kind of charm that he applied. The first office that Joe McCarthy ever ran for was when he was a student at Marquette University running for president of his law school class. And he was running against a very nice guy named Charlie Curran. And they agreed to what they called a gentleman's agreement, that they would each vote for the other one, because it was unseemly. If you had to be elected by voting for yourself, what kind of a gentleman could you have been? So they did that in the first round, and it came out to be a dead tie. McCarthy insisted that they have a runoff. And in that runoff, McCarthy won by two votes, Charlie Curran's vote for him and Joe McCarthy's vote for Joe McCarthy. And Curran was outraged. He said, how could you break our deal? And McCarthy said, I went around telling everybody in this runoff to vote for the best man. And how could I not do the same thing? I had to vote for myself. Curran, as I say, was really steamed. But that's not the end of the story. The story is that not long after that, Charlie Curran's father died. Joe McCarthy was the first one to go and express his condolences. Joe McCarthy borrowed a car, borrowed money for gas money, and drove the long distance to the funeral of Charlie Curran's father. And for the rest of his life, Charlie Curran was a fan of Joe McCarthy's. He understood the double dealing side of McCarthy that had him win by whatever it took to win, including breaking his gentleman's agreement. But he also saw the charming side and to him that mattered more and that mattered more for a long time to half of America. Thank you, Larry. We have a question from Maria Seska who asks, do you think McCarthyism could happen again in this country? to that degree and that level? Um, so if you would ask me before the 2016 election, I would have said absolutely not. We've outgrown that. We could never do this. As I'm arguing now, we have Joe McCarthy redux in our president who seems proud of that. Every time Donald Trump has gotten in trouble the last three and a half years, he says, I wish I had my pal Roy Cohn by my side. And I think what he's really saying is not Roy Cohn. I wish I had my mentor's mentor behind my side, Joe McCarthy. And I think that as bad as I think Joe McCarthy was, having a demagogue in the White House is different than having a demagogue in the US Senate. Thank you, Larry. Sorry, the phone rang in the office. Uh -huh, sorry. Larry, you talk about, and I've heard you talk about the fact that he is now a person whose name has become an ism, and that is not a place that you want to be. Do you think, after researching his life's work as a complete narrative, it's fair for his name to be associated with this awful part of our society? So I would say yes, and I would say no. If the ism is representing the Red Scare and the anti-communist red baiting movement of that time, I would say it shouldn't be his name. He was the least effective of the anti-communist advocates. It used to be said about Joe McCarthy that he could have been dropped into the middle of Red Square 
on May Day and not recognize the real communist. And I think if it was, if we were naming the movement after the most effective anti-communist advocate of that era, it would have been called maybe Dyeism after the head of the House on American Activities Committee, Martin Dyes, or maybe Nixonism, or maybe even Trumanism because President Truman had a loyalty program that he subjected every federal employee to. But it wasn't for any of those reasons. It was the one who was the most colorful and who managed to be on page one the most often, Joe McCarthy. And I think, I like to think of McCarthyism as not just being the red baiting part of what McCarthy did, but it is, it is the reckless accusation. It is political double dealing. It's essentially being amoral and being willing to do whatever it takes to get power and to hold on to power. And if that is the definition of McCarthyism, it is totally fitting that this character, Joe McCarthy, had it named after him. Thanks for that, Larry. One of my colleagues at BU, Karen Brown, asks, Arthur Miller famously wrote The Crucible during the Red Scare. Do you find similarities between the Salem witch trials and McCarthyism? Yes. So I said the words red baiting. The other characterization, the other two word phrase that is often used to describe what Joe McCarthy was doing is witch hunting. And it was because it looked so much like the Salem witch trials. And there's a question, was Arthur Miller writing the crucible about the Salem witch trials or what he, was he writing it about Joe McCarthy and McCarthyism? And I think he was writing it about both. And I think it is totally appropriate to use it only the irony is that Joe McCarthy was the witch hunter who could never find the witch. And I think that this guy was so ineffective that I think much as I probably wouldn't have been part of the movement myself, I think the anti-communist movement had substantial credibility in the 1950s. And the worst enemy that that movement had was Joe McCarthy because he made it seem like anytime you screamed uh, communist, that it was an accusation without merit. And the truth is that there were communists in the government, but the truth is that Joe McCarthy did nothing to root them out. And the truth also is by the time he came along, all the 24 carat spies and traitors were already gone from the government. Larry, you're a reporter, so I'm sure you keep up with the news and you've seen that there's a lot of talk about attacks on American institutions, both the press as the fourth estate, but also our own government. How do you think our institutions weathered the Red Scare and Joe McCarthy's era in the 50s? So I think they weathered them um, poorly in terms of being unable to respond and stop Joe McCarthy before he exercised his reign of terror for four long years. But we're an incredibly resilient country. We've got a brilliant democratic system and we recovered. The Supreme Court ended up striking down most of the things that McCarthy had been doing. Uh, the Senate ended up censuring him. The president finally developed the backbone to stand up against him. And it was what I was saying before, why this is a good news story, that we generally survive these things and come out stronger. And I think we will look back at the end of the era of Trump and whether that end is in two months or in four years and two months. And I think that we will say that we will be a stronger country having survived that but I also think the peril is greater when the demagogue is in the White House as opposed to being in Congress. I see, thank you. Audience members, feel free to type in your questions for Larry either in the chat or the Q&A function. Larry, I also know there are some students here who are themselves studying journalism. So this is less about McCarthy, but more about your career. Uh, what led you to start writing these books, a lot of these biographies, given your background as a Boston Globe award-winning reporter? When did you make that transition and for what reason? So I made it, I spent 20 years as a reporter and I think that I could say honestly that I loved just about every day of it. I also loved every day or met more appropriately every night that I taught at BU for nearly 15 years. And I love seeing 
especially in an era like ours today, where being a journalist isn't always easy. You're attacked, your jobs are um, always in peril because of the financial straits that newspapers and um, the rest of the media find themselves in. Um, but what happened to me was a, an author who I thought was um, one of the greatest journalists turned authors anywhere, a guy named David Halberstam, came in and spoke to a class um, when I was doing a year away from my newspaper uh, for what was called the Neiman Fellowship, a year at, the, at, the, uh, at Harvard University where 12 American and 12 foreign journalists are invited to come and think big thoughts for an entire year. And twice a week, we would have in interesting people to talk to us. And one time it was David Halberstam. He had been an award-winning, a Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter at the New York Times. He had helped break more big stories on the Vietnam War than anybody else. And he came in and brought his notes for his next book. And he let us all pour through his notes. And the point was to show us that his notes for his book looked just like our notes from our next daily newspaper story, only there was more of it. And that the biggest challenge of writing a book wasn't how to go out and report something, and it wasn't how to come back and tell a story. It was how to take a thousand pages of notes instead of two pages of notes and make sense of it and put it all together. So I love writing books, partly because it is all the skills that I learned during my years as a journalist. I love not having editors breathing down my neck you know, every five minutes, instead it's every two years. And I love being able to tell a story instead of 500 words worth of a story, 500 pages worth. And, but it's the same process. And if you like being a journalist, you will like most journalists like doing longer form of it, whether it's magazines or books. Thank you, Larry. And I always, when I grab your books, I so admire the length of the bibliography and index you and your sources and your footnotes. Uh, it's so evident that you are so diligent with your research and compiling this narrative. So it's, it's the fullest story of the man or woman you are covering. Uh, thank you. If there are any questions for Larry on the topic of McCarthyism, oh, here we go. Another one from Maria. How do the present dynamics in the Congress compare to that of the 1950s? Was there the same polarization as there is today? Um, so I've written in the past month, probably 15 op-eds looking at that precise question for newspapers around the country. And I think the dynamics are incredibly similar. The dynamics are similar because it's a closely divided um, on a partisan basis Congress with the Republicans holding a very narrow majority. It is similar dynamics because there is extraordinary antipathy on either side of the aisle to the other side of the aisle. And I think that it is also similar because a lot of what plays out in Congress, people are afraid to stand up to a bully today the way they were afraid to stand up to a bully 70 years ago. And I think that again, I hate to keep bringing it back to, but, but the questions are about what's going on today. And I think that at the point where it looked like Donald Trump was bringing down members of the Senate, you are watching and you will watch them jump ship. Next to us here in Massachusetts in the state of Maine, Senator Collins, who is up for reelection, um, who's ironically, whose mentor, who, whose role model in the US Senate was a woman named Margaret Chase Smith, who is most famous for taking on John McCarthy, the bully. Susan Collins is now breaking with President Trump over the question of the Supreme Court nomination over a number of things, because she realizes that in her state, at least, his popularity has plummeted enough that she's got to cut bait to survive herself. And I think that when people are willing to take on demagogues is when they see their own political future at stake. And that's when the Senate did it in 1954. And that's when the Senate will do it in 2000, whatever it turns out to be. Larry, let's look to the future. Tell us why your next project is about the Jasmine. So it's my reward to myself and my publisher's reward to me for having spent 
two and a half long years with a guy like Joe McCarthy, a sinister character like that, I can spend the next two and a half years with uplifting by definition, these three guys were um, the people who had America stomping its foot to their music. They were also, I think at a moment today, the only story as important as the one of sort of what's going on with bullies in our government is the one of what's going on with racial justice in our society. And to me, one of the ways of seeing the story of how America tried to overcome its history of Jim Crow cruel racial segregation was by looking at these jazz musicians, that they played to biracial, to mixed race audiences. They had in their bands whites and blacks. And I think as much as the board versus, uh, the uh, Brown versus Board of Education or all the legal struggles over racial segregation, I think the people who my book will argue set the table for all of that were these people in our popular culture that showing the world wouldn't fall apart if blacks and whites could actually get together at a place like the Thurman Center and show that comedy and unity could really happen and we could find common ground. That's wonderful, Larry. And I'm sure we will be happy to have you back. Terrific. The jazz men. This time, if there's no last questions, I will conclude the program with Larry. Five second warning, everybody. Well, Larry, it was so great to have you back. It's been four years, it doesn't feel that way. So we'll do this every four years and I loved it. Absolutely, we've done Robert Kennedy, we've done Joe McCarthy, and we'll do non-political figures in four years or so. Perfect. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful night or wherever this may find you and we'll see you soon.